Under other circumstances, we would be gathered together now in St. Mark's Church in the Bowery. St. Mark's Church is located on the unceded homeland of the Lenape people, Lenape Hoking. I'm speaking to you now from what is known as Union City, New Jersey, which is the unceded land of the Munse Lenape people. We recognize the continual displacement and violence perpetrated against indigenous people and people of color by the US and are aware that these kinds of acknowledgements can be misused as stand-ins for actual decolonization work, which is something for us to bear in mind as we go forward in our ongoing commitment to accountability, reparation, and equity. We hope that those tuning in feel welcomed and included in this work from their own respective places as well. And as one step toward that, we encourage you to visit the resource nativeland.ca, which we'll place in the chat. To engage with poetry as though it exists in a vacuum of aesthetics and is not material in an actual world acting and acted upon by political and economic factors is not a sign of respect. It is an abdication of responsibility. As the work of Yin Yi and Juliana Spar helps us to see, the publication and distribution of poetry is determined by hundreds of factors, each weighted and slanted by white heteropatriarchal capitalist oppressions, intelligence agencies, propagandizing efforts, and the determined efforts of fascist forces. Regardless of your own opinions on the power of poetry to impact the actual world, it should not be ignored that political organizations, government agencies, and nation states take such power very seriously. Part of a poet's responsibility then is to also take our work seriously enough to approach it, not as a platonic ideal, but as a means to engage with the world. As Juliana Spar and Joshua Clover wrote a few years back, being a poet, if it is to be in any way meaningful, doesn't mean being a person who engages the world through poems. It means being a person who is in the world and for whom writing poems is one possibility and trying to figure out what is needed. It means recognizing the political as a case, as a situation, before we have been captured by the question that begins as poets. We ask first, what does a situation need to help it along? Poems are neither the answer nor not. I am grateful to Yin Yi and Juliana Spar for joining us today. Yin Yi will be reading first from a new lecture and then Juliana will read and then we will have time for a Q&A. If during the event you think of a question, we encourage you to message your question to Andrea who has Q&A in their display name. In the year of blue water, Yin Yi writes, my therapist tells me that I need to work on holding on to myself. This is my first therapist. I don't know what she means. I thought that having myself was not supposed to take any effort. I think of these lines often. It's difficult not to, they hold so much. One of the qualities I most admire of Yin Yi's work is his preternatural ability to write an interrog interrogative so clarifying it throws everything around it into a bright relief. It undoes and it rebuilds. It allows for and enacts possibility. It is with this reorienting of focus, which Yin Yi employs with such ease, it belies its power that Yin Yi is able to reveal the structures that shape our inner and outer worlds. As he writes, poems are a way to ask for what exists, to invite what wants to be visible. But Yin Yi's focus does not only concern those things which want visibility, his critical work elucidates and contextualizes the systems of oppression that seek to influence cultural production and go unnamed. He commits to disentangling the thorny brambles of crypto fascist maneuverings within and among cultural institutions. He recenters marginalized people who stand to lose everything while others argue over the question of whether poetry can or should be political. As Yin Yi notes in editing in the fascist impulse, I do not fear interpretation, only that some of us are not free to be wrong. Yin Yi is the author of Dream of the Divided Field, forthcoming in 2022 and the Year of Blue Water, winner of the 2018 Yale Series of Younger Poets Prize. His work has been featured in or at NPR's All Things Considered, New York Public Library, Tin House, Granta, and a public space and he is a recipient of fellowships from Asian American Writers Workshop and Poets House. Currently, he is poetry editor at Foundry and gives creative advice at The Reading. 
His generosity and intelligence have been an incredibly stabilizing force for me in a time of disintegration and tumult. I'm so grateful to have him here tonight. I'm now going to turn it over to Yin Yi. Hi. So, so I, okay, cool. Thank you. So I have a talk. Um, it's an essay that I'm working on and I'm just gonna share my screen um, before I dive into what I've written. Okay, so you see, you, you all see like the presentation, right? Not the other thing that I wrote, okay, thank you. So good evening, everyone. Thank you to Roberto for inviting me back to the Poetry Project to speak tonight. Um, this talk is a version of an essay I'm working on about an incident that happened in November 2018 at Poetry Magazine. It involves a poem called Titan All Is Still by British poet Toby Martinez de las Rivas, who is accused of being a fascist and the poem a piece of crypto fascism. The criticism, questions, and close readings at the time revolved around these accusations. The US debate happened mostly on Twitter, but was a continuation, I learned later, of a debate that had already been going on in the UK, with close readings published both for and against Martinez's work as fascist. It seems to me that the vigorous response to the poem and its defenses illustrated that there was more at stake than Martinez's reputation. More questions appeared after all my reading of and around Martinez's poems and their interpretations. Questions about who can afford to be uncertain, what benefits from doubt, and what in language and how we read and interpret language fuels the necessary ignorance for existing power structures to continue. What in poetry and how we choose to read poetry makes way for ideologies that are not merely oppressive, but obliterating. So while I may be reading Martinez's work, my lecture tonight is about uncertainty. It is about what poetry can tell us and what poetry as an institutionalized apparatus works to not tell us. How the way we were taught to read may be failing what we need in this moment of history and what we might aim to do instead. On November 23rd, 2018, poet and Ruth Lilly fellow Roy Guzman posted a close reading of a poem in the November 2018 issue of Poetry Magazine. Their reading sounded the alarm of a possible fascist poem headed off by a dog whistle buried in the first line. A black sun rises in the west of me and will never set. The black sun was an SS symbol during the Nazi era and according to Southern Poverty Law Center, has also been adopted by neo-Nazis and white supremacists since then. The poem, an excerpt from Titan All Is Still, is by the British, the British poet Toby Martinez de las Rivas, henceforth Martinez. Further close readings of the poem followed in Guzman's thread, the broad strokes of which I will attempt to reproduce here in my own rereading. A significant part of the critique centered on the use of color symbolism, particularly white. On the first page, there's a you who draws in black air and puts a white arm around the speaker, thick white spots on a deer, it's on the next part. Um, the black sky and the, white, and the sky white as chalk and walking backward on the white road into the white sky toward the white city, black sun clearing the horizon. Though it's not clear yet whether black or white holds specific associations, the poem includes bluebells, flickering Islamic greens and Spanish grays. It gets clearer further into the poem when there is only day in the white irradiate city and his government will never fail. Before this, Martinez writes of this other life that will be ours where our eyes like a golems, empty of their own will, but full of his, and all are made equal, implying that the dead city is faded, perhaps even desirable, and noting along the way that the speaker will stand before you when you wish as this Lord's faded inferior. Reading on, one can't help but also notice the use of diacritics, such as in words like you, as above here. It's English crossed with accents, perhaps from Spanish, also used in the poem, uh, creating a, a strange exoticization, 
or it could be after Gerard Manley Hopkins, who used diacritics for his sprung rhythms. On from that, the Lord will eat the speaker's pronoun, an unsettling image for readers like me, trans people who have fought for their own, but also could be the self being consumed by the will of an all-consuming God. The poem presents this God of dead city, also the white city. It, pre it presents a God who will override the speakers and mouses individuality with his will. And as you can see here, and his government will never fail for no glory is allowed, but his glory, no bone governance, but his bone governance, no prison camp, but his prison camp, his plantations, his will and technique, his punishment, beatings, his censorship, his textual criticism, his forgiveness, his rehabilitation, Oh, fearful men and unbeliefful and cursed and malquerous, which is, I guess, old English. Titan always still presents an inevitable world punished and rehabilitated by this authority's government, prison camp, and plantations. Ending this litany with a quote from the Book of Revelation from a section about how the fearful men and unbelieving and cursed and murderers will end up in a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. The end of the excerpt brings an authority different from the authority of the Lord in his dead city, his kingdom that has no contiguity with ours, no conformita, the streets empty of opposition. In 2018, the reading of the poem focused on the inevitability of this city with its streets empty of opposition, a disturbing thought given the uprisings that were and are going on right now. Yet, in my reading now, I also see this authority in contrast to that of the Lord in his dead city is separate. An authority born of nays, a lover's music. Could it be possible that it seems to speak against the incoming fate of the Lord in his dead city, not in support of it? So this part of this poem goes on. Even the polis with their holsters and war clubs looking on carefully and asexually like angels come to lie with the daughters of men. So polis is cops in Spanish, but also city-state in Greek. Um, again, the reading could go two ways. The speaker calling the polis angels, or the speaker overcoming that dead city, that authority of a punitive lord with the authority of Ney's music. But why then does the speaker also ask, have they buried Mami Mbai? They are erasing a name for the wall, and the quarter is pacified. I read they as the angelic police, with these lines seeming to be critical of Mami Mbai's name being erased from the wall. And I'm feeling less convinced that Martinez's piece might be sympathetic to fascism or white supremacy, despite its aesthetics of decreation. I double back. Who was Mami Mbai? An undocumented Senegalese immigrant who died of a heart attack while running from the police in Madrid, I discover. His name perhaps was not familiar to me in 2018, appears at the bottom of this last section in a way that disturbs me. Lying with you, nay, in the sun, in the clouds, half listening to the Senegalese preacher two mornings after the riots when they ran Mame Bimbai down the gutter and wishing you would go by your mutes and play again here in silence for them and for me and yourself and the polis. Why play too for the polis who killed Mame Mbai and confer upon them that authority from earlier? Or does he mean the polis as city state and not polis as in the police? It's not clear either whether they refers to the riots or to the police. And as someone who reads and writes for the double entendre, I assume Martinez may, means both. But while uncertainty has always been a comfort to me in poetry, the stakes of what's uncertain here unnerves me. Rereading these lines, Martinez's speaker goes on to say that Ney's authority while playing is control that is liberation, perhaps too close to the famous gates of Auschwitz where work sets you free. As a subject of the margins, my safety requires my judgment. I've learned to read for not what's not openly offered in a room or a neighborhood, picking out small signs, large trucks, American flags, the time a store, clerk, a store clerk takes to stare at me and then my ID. Nowadays, I've been doing a lot more of this kind of reading. This too is a way that I read poems because poems read by me are poems that exist with me. 
Then there's the way I was taught in school. The poem as its only source of interpretation, as was suggested in one defense of Martinez, and the new critical method championed by the anti-Semitic Eliot. To read the text and only the text, to be certain only of what the text would say of itself. Reading the poem now, I wonder with you, and what if it's not something the text would say of itself? Titan All Is Still arrived in poetry in November 2018. In August 2017, neo-Nazis and white supremacists de descended upon Charlottesville, Virginia, two years after a white supremacist massacred nine black people at a Charleston church. The rally included attendees from Vanguard, a white supremacist organization whose Texas chapter includes the Nazi Black Sun in its logo. In May 2018, the Trump administration began its zero tolerance policy at the US-Mexican border, announcing that immigrants and anyone who aided them would be prosecuted, beginning a practice of separating families on top of detaining migrants in concentration camps. By November 2018, Trump had called white supremacists who killed Heather Heyer very fine people, black, black protesters, traitors, and the black majority countries such as Haiti and Nigeria, shithole countries. Asians were told to go back to our countries and racist hate crimes rose all across the US, all in the name of destroying and remaking an America that could be great again. None of these events could have been far from the minds of American poets reading Titan All Is Still, although they were likely closer for any marginalized readers, even closer for black people and Latinx readers whose communities were being tortured shot at and punished by the US state in that very moment. It's not insignificant that Guzman is a Honduran immigrant and Honduras is where 250,000 migrants came to the US seeking asylum from, from fall 2018 to 2019. In November, 2018, I, along with many others responded by quoting Guzman's thread saying, thank you for this thread about the fascist politics of Topi Martinez de las Rivas. I hope sincerely that we will get an answer from Poetry Magazine. Why was this poem selected? There needs to be an official response on what this poem actually and dangerously presents. Guzman's thread is now deleted and poetry did respond, but not in the manner that I had hoped they would. When I read my surroundings, there's always a double back. Did I see what I saw? Did I hear what I heard? I hold myself in uncertainty as if I'm waiting for the words, the symbols, to change what they mean on their own. I work on waiting for the right response. I work on remembering wrong. Charles Mills, via Bonyasi and Smith, notes that white ignorance is not passive as we might imagine. It is militant and aggressive, a disassembly line, an active deconstruction. So let's make the word more active. Let's get rid of ignorance. Let's call it a process of unknowing. On November 27, 2018, the magazine tweeted uh, its only official editorial response. To our readers, we have been listening. The tweet linked to, an 1, to a 1,894 word statement by Toby Martinez de las Rivas in Poetry's Harriet blog. In the response, Martinez clarified his use of the black sun, stating the genesis of this image was utterly banal, conceived to serve as section markers in his 2014 book, Terror. I hit on a white circle, then, which I felt was more ominous, a black circle, an eclipse, a black sun. He goes, he goes on to explain that as the way with symbols, however, it became more than that as the book progressed. I find the genesis plausible. I've certainly written or included images or phrases that have revealed their meaning to me in time, including the title of my first book. Southern Poverty Law Center on its page for Charlottesville hate group symbols takes care to state that the black sun is based on the ancient sun wheel artifacts that were made and used by Norse and Germanic tribes as symbol of their pagan beliefs. Those sun wheels made centuries upon centuries ago do not usually resemble the complexity of this particular version, referring to 
the one that I showed earlier on the Vanguard flag. Martinez says as much in, in his response, speaking to the use of the black sun in Christian symbolism. But then he also tells of his symbols accumulated meanings. He mentions that in one poem, Avenging and Bright, it rises as a symbol of vengeance over London, not as was suggested in the blog post because London is multicultural, but because it exerts such a powerful economic and cultural attraction over the rest of the UK. This explanation is not reassuring to me, quite the contrary. I can't square with what he says above with the knowledge that Stephen Miller in 2017 called Jim Acosta a cosmopolitan during a news conference, a veiled anti-Semitic epithet used as a way of branding people or movements that are unmoored to the traditions and beliefs of a nation or fighting words for a nationalist as Politico reported, reported at the time. It just so happens that to anti-Semites, these unmoored people are often Jews. In an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, Jews hold the keys to outsized multinational networks of political and financial influence. Take the 1903 forgery, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, an Ur text of anti-Semites, as an example of where one might find this trope. As The Atlantic recently summarized, this book traces the idea that Jews would destroy institutions with monetary, media, and electoral manipulation, and that the world will fall in the hands of a cunning elite who have schemed forever and are now fated to rule until the end of time. Martinez's Avenging and Bright appears on the same spread as a piece titled To a Metropolitan Poet in 2018's Black Sun. The poem starts with a reflection on inevitable judgment, divine or personal, then follows up with this judgment. Christ, I can't stand those popinjays, so deep in theory, so ostentatiously tolerant, always wanting to interrogate shit or exp excavate shit when what they mean is read shit. This is so fucking pointless, Tobe. You are not theirs, finally, or even his, that sees beauty where no other can. It's not clear to me if the speaker is speaking to their own inner voice or if there is another speaker who says, this is so fucking pointless, Tobe. I assume that this is Tobe's inner monologue going against the metropolitan poets, where the resolution is not to examine the origin of these emotions, but to confer upon himself the ability to see beauty where no other can. In the rest of the response, Martinez explains the occasion of the excerpt broken into three poems an elegy for his stepmother and a friend, John, an address to his daughter, Mouse, during a legal battle with her mother, and a third poem about the police chase and death of Mami Mumbai. He also speaks on the reasoning for a poem he published in 2010, Elegy for the Young Hitler. He does not affirm that he is not a fascist. Two reasons I can conceive of. First, that First, that he looks at the accusations as so preposterous that they do not warrant a direct address. This seems supported by a rather patronizing statement he makes after admitting there is a modern fascist association of the Black Sun. This isn't ideal, but I trusted the critical engagement of my readership and proceeded. The implication being that the fascist reading was, of course, not critical engagement. The second possibility is much more sinister. The alt-right in the US has exploited interpretive uncertainty in disseminating their ideas. With satire, irony, and internet memes, these jokes reestablish anti-Semitism, racism, and white supremacy and into the fabric of mainstream conservatism. Two brief examples to speak on this, the flag of the alt-right country, Kekistan, based on a Nazi war flag, the second, the OK hand symbol appropriated by white supremacists, you can't, it's, you can see it's like over here, uh, appropriated by white supremacists flashed most recently a few days ago at this Trump rally, I believe it was the 24th in Florida. The first example can hide behind the irony of a joke. The second in its more innocuous use. Through benefit of a doubt, those who flash these signs can disseminate and disavow their beliefs at the same time pointing to what the text simply does not say for certain. The outcry continued. This time, writers were enraged that no editorial justification had been given, and Poetry Magazine had expanded Martinez's platform even more. 
For context, a single blog post on Poetry's Harriet pays $400 along with Poetry's customary $10 a line or $300 uh, per poem minimum for publication in the magazine. I have no reason to believe that Martinez was paid for his response, and that remains my assumption until I find evidence to the contrary. Poetry's silence was what I commented on at the time. If you are an editor and you advance and champion work that can be reasonably read as fascist, then either you have failed in your specialized duty as an editor and you must rectify your practice and knowledge and respond, or that is the work that you want to support. Of course, whose readings are reasonable? What makes them count as such? Martinez never says in his poem or his response that he is or isn't a fascist, at least not like the fascist artists of yore, be it Ezra Pound, blasting on radio for fascists in Italy, Marinetti, whose futurist political party later merged with Mussolini's, or Lenny Reifenstahl, who filmed Hitler's propaganda. Could symbols and aesthetics catch a fascist, so to speak? And was poetry's interpretive silence actually in lockstep with practices that open space for ideologies like fascism to slip in? In the search for an anti-fascist language, Yulia Komska asks what happens to language that's been used by fascists. Do we settle and await for more black suns to spot, skirt, and excise? What does this formula achieve? A less fascist language? A non-fascist language? Certainly not an anti-fascist language, she writes. Komska gives an example. A series called From the Dictionary of the Inhuman started in 1945, a volume of essays used to track Nazi language crimes that would explain their history, usage, and why repeating them would affirm the Nazi ideology that had just used them, hoping to wake German speakers to their insidious pasts. By 1967, this, miss this mission had faltered, for Germans had yet again recycled their language. The authors had blamed all linguistic evils on the Third Reich, but it turned out the inhuman draws sustenance from all words, inherent manipulability. Words and symbols live with an inherent manipulability. Their meanings shift and their associations rearrange if one knows how to alter them. Change enough meanings of words and the frame changes too. In poetry, as in life, I'm committed to this manipulability. It's, what got, it's what's gotten me out of frames I felt most trapped in. But to change is also not to forget. It occurs to me that when I wanted a response from poetry, I wanted an interpretation not of what the poem or its author offered, but a response to the poem in the world we, you, me, it, all occupied. So when Martinez acknowledges the Black Sun Association, then unknows it, thanks to critical engagement of his readership, it's clear to me that the threat of fascist, white supremacist, and anti-Semitic violence is not real enough a possibility to him to be worthy of interpretation. So the search for an anti-fascist language doesn't begin with excising language. An anti-fascist language begins with interpreting it. The most alarming part of the Martinez situation is not the poem he has written or whether he is a fascist. It is, the roots of fa it is that the roots of fascism can be embedded or manipulated into respectable politics, Christian mysticism, and in the English language itself with enough usage and context for those interpretations. Unknowing keeps these associations in the language, shields them in the shadows until they are ready to be used again, perhaps unknowingly by someone like Martinez. Komska again. The rub was that the fascists did not invent so-called fascist language, nor were they even its most ardent practitioners. The roots went much deeper, taking a kind of proto-fascist bent that language seems inevitably to, to possess whenever it becomes wrapped up with national identity and, un and unbridled quests for power. The cause for alarm around Titan all is still was not a single symbol that was enacted, but how it existed in concert with others well-established symbols in the history of the English language and Christianity. Martinez was not alarmed because he imagined the, the connection tenuous at best. He imagined readers with critical engagement, readers of good faith, readers who could walk through the world without knowledge of other black sons or anti-Semitic tropes or easily dismiss them. 
readers whose interpretations would be repeated by reputable critics on respectable venues. Not a reader like Guzman, not a reader like me. The process of unknowing, the system of insisting on, interpret and on interpreting differently from. One month after the excerpt from Titan All Is Still runs, I receive a copy of Paris Review's winter issue. It includes another excerpt from the same poem. No one says anything, at least not yet. Martinez did not publish alone. He did not select his poem for publication. He did not upload his response. I wondered too if he was asked to write it. Poetry counted on distancing itself from Martinez by installing Martinez as the sole interpreter of his work. Cultural hegemony counts on throwing individuals out as a way to dodge accountability. It counts on the official records of the, of the author's intent to erase its effects. It counts on distracting by exploiting, blaming, and arguing over an individual to obscure its systemic role. It counts on the ways it teaches us, taught us, to read. And if unknowing was a system, that I imagine. Mm -hmm. I think what happens then is you read something and if you read it in good faith, it's almost like that innocence, mm -hmm. which is desirable in a reader and a writer and in humanity. The innocence means that you don't know what lurks behind things mm -hmm. if there is intent behind them that is evil or uncomprehending or even inadvertently. Mm. So that was Don Cher, um, who, who kind of tangentially talked about an image like a black sun um, in, a, on, in March 2019 in a verse episode um, with uh, Franny Choi and Denise Smith. Um, but there's never been kind of an official response like published anywhere. Um, and it's not about whether everyone can read. It's about whose reading matters, whose readings show up in reputable magazines, whose readings appear on poetry's blog, whose readings choose the prize winners, which systems set up the prizes and why. The benefit of waiting for certainty, the benefit of a doubt, is not having to act any differently. But what if your evidence is my death? I am reading while my partner drives us into a new town while large trucks drive by streaming American flags, Trump signs littering the lawns. I am reading when we stop at a gas station. My partner, white, goes out to the pump. I stay sitting in the car. I cannot say what I don't know. Yet, for whom is my silence the most comfortable interpretation? As a subject of the margins, my life has been a trial of navigating uncertainty. Uncertainty laps at every corner, broken only by whisper networks and anonymous accounts. While there is no official word on harm that could come to someone with my body. I'm read by my body and I read with it. My life depends on not what I know, but what I can read. Every marginalized person at one point or another must learn to read the ambiguous. We learn what we can tolerate and what we can't. We learn what we can be uncertain of. So who can afford to be uncertain? Who will die if we're wrong? Komska suggests in the end that we might confront fascism by remembering an easily deployed song or rhyme, what comes from poetry and not from rhetoric to respond with new words, new worlds, creation in the face of decreation, to respond, which depends on interpretation, to respond to a world that includes not only the viewpoint of one author or one poem, but one that includes you and includes me, which depends on interpreting for all of us and respond we must. Thanks, I finished. Thank you so much, Mimi. Um, that was truly incredible. Um, and um, sorry, I'm taking it back a little. It, uh, it was really wonderful. And um, 
Thank you for sharing with everyone. Uh, as a reminder, um, there is a Q&A after um, both uh, Juliana Spar and Yin Yi. Um, so if you think of any questions, feel free to message them to Andrea, who has Q&A in their display name. I'm now going to repeat uh, what I said earlier. To engage with poetry as it exists in a vacuum of aesthetics and is not material in an actual world acted upon by political and economic factors is not a sign of a respect. It is an abdication of responsibility. The superstitious energy that coalesces around hushed discussions of resource allocation and social climbing reminds me of the discomfort that haunts discussions of wages with one's coworkers. Who taught us to feel that discussing wages was impolite and what or whose purpose does our discomfort serve? Juliana Spar's poetry and critical work breached this silence with a galvanizing and uncompromising energy. Du Bois's telegram charts and analyzes the ways in which intelligence agencies in the United States manipulate and fund poetry in order to further their own foreign and domestic policy goals. Spar also delves into the deeper questions of how poetry can or cannot extricate itself from the nationalisms that claim it. As Spar notes, nationalism is not only something bought, but something that many participate in voluntarily and something that is passively affirmed. I deeply admire how Spar's poetry interrogates its own trappings. So many poets view poetry as a child might view their parent, askance and beyond the occasion of the real. Spar takes poetry seriously enough to address its limitations. As she writes in the really remarkable Wither Be Singing, how to write an epiphonic possibility in this sociality. I had written for so long about being together, about how we were together, like it or not. I had used metaphor of breath and of space. I had embraced the epiphonic, not just at the end of the poem as was a lyric convention, but sometimes I even made the whole poem epiphonic and that I couldn't do anymore. Lately, there wasn't any singing that I could hear, just attempts, dark times. Nothing about this terrible moment was new though. It has always been a terrible moment. And there have always been poets too, and always poets writing a terrible nation into existence. I'm so grateful for Juliana for her work, which moves to catalog and counter this terrible nation making, lineating space for resistance. Juliana Spar is the author of more than 10 books of poetry, criticism, and fiction, most recently, Du Bois's Telegram, Literary Resistance, and State Containment, and The Winter the Wolf Came. She is also the recipient of a National Poetry Series Award and Hardison Poetry Prize. She is also a former intern of the Poetry Project, and we are so grateful to welcome her back here tonight. I'm now turning it over to Juliana Spar. Thank you. Um, also, that was an incredible talk. It's really interesting. I look forward to talking more about it um, afterwards. Um, I'm going to read. Um, a version of this poem that Roberto just quoted, Will There Be Singing? Um, and I wrote a first version of it for this reading that Andrea organized at the Ear Inn. And um, then a version of it appeared in this poets.org website. And I, there was a lot of back and forth with them. And they had asked me to remove these kinds of moments where I quote, um, I don't know, troubled language in some way. And I put those back in. Um, and then I've expanded it some, and it's kind of like, so it, it's a, it's a version of that in some way that's kind of changed. Um, so it's always been a terrible nation, this nation, our nation. First, we were something terrible and next we were something more terrible. That said for sure, I love the land that it claims but the land that it claims, I don't claim. It's always been a terrible nation, this nation, our nation. Just a few years ago, it was a certain sort of terrible and now more terrible. One moment I'm napping on the couch, television on, and when I wake up half asleep still, I am looking at a woman, index, finger, and thumb held in a circle. She sits behind a possible Supreme Court judge. I wasn't the only one who noticed it, but still everyone acted like that fight was all about gender. It was, and it wasn't. The story goes on and on. 
One moment I am napping on the couch and I stir half asleep still and there is Richard Spencer doing the hail Trump sig hail at that semi-respectable alt-right confab just prior to the inauguration and it was received as NBD. I am napping on the couch when all the boys except one in the prom picture at Barabu High School do a sig hail. Also napping when one of us got knifed at the Golden State Skinheads in Sacramento and if that wasn't bad enough, one of the skinheads posted a picture of another one of us on Facebook, his hand over one of us's wound, pour, blood pouring over the shirt. And most of the comments were all about how one of us was probably a Jew. Look at his Jew nose. It's always been a terrible nation, this nation, our nation. First something terrible, then something possibly more terrible. They came after us wave after wave, sick hail after sick hail. I had to call my mom one day and tell her that her name was on 4chan under a post that began, here are a bunch of commie Jew faggots. Not that my mom was mentioned as a commie Jew faggot. She was mentioned as having birthed me a commie Jew faggot. There was her address and her phone number in case someone wanted to call her and complain. This confused her. Why would anyone do that, she said. It sounds like Nazi Germany. And I said, well, that is because they are Nazis. And then felt badly for telling her because really, how does one explain to one's mom this moment? The terribleness of 4chan trolls and also their likely irrelevance combined with the double bind of living with the idea of their likely irrelevance and yet also knowing that there are moments in history when considering Nazis irrelevant didn't go well at all. Don't tell anyone who you don't know that you know me. I tell her, just hang up. This didn't help really either. It confused her more, but I said it again. No one will ever call you about me that wants something good for me. But really to the 4chan trolls, I was so unspecial. There is no denying I got the least of it. No one in the legislature tried to pass a law that I should be fired. And only one person called my boss to complain about how I was a commie Jew faggot. My boss, very confused, hung up on them. By the end of the year, we were used to things we hadn't seen before, like a series of street balls between Fa and Anti-Fa that often absurdly tumbled into the Berkeley All Organic full of strollers farmers market. Used to hearing about friends' emails caught up in various FOIAs. Used to no longer answering the phone. Used to the phone messages that began, you fucking panko pussy faggot. And the DMs and the ats came in from all directions. If there was anything new about this moment, it was just the time when there was no left and no meaningful right in the way I had previously understood it, which was as a convention. Things happened and they came in from all different directions. One day an anonymous white nationalist and next a well-known comrade angry in love and wanting to take it out on someone proximate. And then perhaps a blog post from someone who had been perfectly nice when last seen, and who now was very upset about something they felt I had implied, even though I had not meant to imply that wrong. There was no way to explain it to the vastness of the internet. It was hard to decipher who was hating what on what day by the time the state was burning for both ends and one end was called paradise. We didn't bother with the metaphor. Instead, we looked out the window, noticed the smoke, shut the window, stayed indoors and kept on typing. Later we joked, now we know what we will be doing when the world burns. We will be shutting the windows and catching up on email finally. I'm concerned about these other things or that is what I thought they said when they were worried I was losing my relationship to poetry. It was still summer, still mid afternoon. There was a nice breeze. We had half a day of this beauty before us and we knew it. Unhurried pleasure. We drank a beer that was fresh on the tongue in a new way, light, almost carbonated. They said they were concerned about me and my relationship to poetry and the afternoon sun as the breeze blew softly. I first protested to them not about poetry, but about poets, their nationalism, their acquiescence, but also their Facebook and Twitter accounts, their brags and their minor attacks, their politics, their prizes and their publications, their Democratic Party affiliations. They write Ringo's to Obama, I said, and then they, not the same they, but still part of they write blog, po blog posts calling me a cop. I said, it's like this. A friend was assaulted by someone in my house after a poetry reading, not just any poetry reading, but a lovingly assembled community poetry reading that was supposed to be better. And a few months later, a bunch of women wrote an open letter and said, keep away from this guy, he assaults. It wasn't the first time he had done this. I didn't sign the open letter, didn't write it either. Not that I'm proud of that, just how it was. 
When the woman called the assaulter out, they also called me up for having been talking to him over the years as part of the problem. And they were right. Then a poet wrote a blog post about how I was a cop snitching on communists because the assaulter happened to be a communist. And in his understanding, communists should not be called to a task for assaulting. He sent me an email with the link in case I missed it. This terrible nation, this frayed cloth called poetry community. So I said to them, I'm not concerned about my relationship to poetry, which regularly felt to me like that moment when you open your app and there are a bunch of mentions and you haven't posted anything for a while and all you can do is say, oh, fuck my life and start to work through them. This is not the same as the oh shit of the sick pale bros at the palm prom or the 4chan comedy faggot Jew stuff. But still how to write an apophatic possibility in the sociology where I was both a commie Jew faggot and a cop who snitched on communists. I had written for so long about being together, about how we were together, like it or not. I had used a metaphor of breath and of space. I had embraced the apophonic, not just at the end of the poem, as was the Illyric convention, but so I sometimes made the whole poem epiphonic, and that I couldn't do anymore. When the stick shot across the crowd and landed at my feet, and the kid next to me picked it up and ran back into the fight, screaming, take this, anti foss stick raised over his head. I saw it come down on two heads at the same time. And that was all I saw because someone chasing someone else ran between us and they sprayed bear mace, so I looked away, eyes tearing. Later that day, a dumpster was pushed back and forth, an anti fall shove, followed by an oath keeper shove, followed by an anti fall shove, followed by an identity Europa shove. What was this moment? Was it comedy, a farce, merely a meme? Then 17 were shot in Parkland and another 40 in a synagogue. I'm not even mentioning the possible insect apocalypse. Lately, there wasn't any singing that I could hear, just attempts, dark times. Nothing about this terrible nation stuff was new though. It has always been a terrible nation and there have always been poets too. And always poets writing the terrible nation into existence. When that Obama ringa started, two poems were presented each day by two different poets. Each day, another poet that I respected, considered friend, maybe even loved. Name after name is celebrating the sanity, elegance, and enlightened compassion of the Obama presidency. Last year, the poem that got the most clicks on the Academy of American Poets website was about forgiveness. This would be over 250,000 clicks. The title is Forgiveness. It is about how to really know the power of kindness, one must know sorrow, and the second stanza of the poem urges us to look at a dead Indian and a white poncho by the side of the road. A handsome dead Indian, the poem says. All I can figure out is that the poem seems to be asking us to look at all that is terrible in this moment, migrancy brought on by terror, not desire, the terrible nation, the economic disparities that leave some hungry, leave some on the side of the road dead and forgive. This is one reason I will never get a tramp stamp that says poetry is my boyfriend. I thought for a while there were two sorts of poets. Poets who write the terrible nation into existence and poets fucking around doing something else. For years, I was on team poets fucking around doing something else. For years, I had used poetry to slip away, elude the hold of the family, the couple form, the policing of tradition to pry open time into an endless stretch of possibility. And that room where we try to pry open possibility. When I first heard the avant-garde, I heard it as an opening, a door, a window, maybe a garage door, one where you press a button and the door slowly opens. At the very least, a hole in the wall I could shimmy through. I heard it as opening, all sorts of openings. I could make the hole or my pink crowbar could. I would be writing and I would fall into the singing, that whoosh, the singing whoosh, because at first I saw myself as someone who wanted an opening in the tradition. I split this wish up all the time. I fragmented it into words and took away its dictics. Another friend, a poet who no longer talks to me, once gave me the image of the pink crowbar as a way of thinking about writing. Losing her was a loss all around, but to compensate for that loss, I often think about pulling something open. Although I'm fairly convinced she would grab the pink crowbar out of my hand if she saw me wielding it. It was that moment after the reading when we had to leave the bar because the couples were coming to buy their cocktails and we couldn't figure out where to go. Maybe it was Friday or Saturday night and all the bars were full of people who, kept not, who were not talking about poetry. So we kept walking, looking at each bar and each one wrong. Eventually the streets opened up and we were at the bridge and there was a river and we walked across the open space to the river and climbed down its sides and sat there. 
We had probably bought some beers and a small glass flask of whiskey from our bodega. We probably carried the cans and the flask and brown bags as a convention, even though we did not need this convention. If there was law, the law drove by didn't stop. Other things were night, maybe moon, water, rats. Sometimes drugs were involved. We walked through Wall Street at 3 a.m. and we rattled the locked doors of all the buildings laughing at their absurdity because we knew where it was at. And at was rattling the doors. That is what I thought of as the whoosh. If at first I thought the poem could be freed of its traditions and measured conventions, later I embraced them. Thought of its sentiment as a mode, as a genre. During these years, I still use poetry to slip away, still build elaborate patterns of songs, even if I recognized its songs as institutional. I thought that poetry could be apart from the nation still. I now think I did not understand the genre that well, or at least the pressures on it, the nation's peculiar interest in it, the presidential invitations, the ribbons, and the directives. That day as the breeze blew and the beer we drank was vibrant, bubbly, we were delighted with it. I said, I love Césaire. I said this to them in that late afternoon light, that sort that throws its patterns on the walls. I love Césaire, I said, because he had neither Facebook nor Twitter, and even for a while had no nation. And then I added, same for Shelley, Cesare, Shelley, Rukeyser, I mumbled later, as we walked away from the bar, Bracht, Fodeba, Blake, oh, Rimbaud also. I looked around the room at the poetry reading and said, what the fuck, to myself a lot. I couldn't write the whoosh. I couldn't even write this Ars Poetica. Once I realized that the revolution could be a boyfriend. I just couldn't write anymore. I realized that the revolution could be a boyfriend because a friend got a tattoo that said the revolution is my boyfriend across their lower back in the tramp stamp sort of way. Another friend had recently killed himself and he said this a lot. And so they got it as a tramp stamp because where else would one get a tattoo that said the revolution is my boyfriend. They got it as a greeting and they got it as a memory. At first I thought of it as the inverse of bros before hoes, and now I think of it as a variation of bros before hoes. One less about the ties of gender, one about how bros is an open category, maybe a pithy phrase about how we found each other at the occupations, about how a revolution matters more than this imposed couple form. Make fun of it if you will, and I see your mockery, but I vow to hold on to this sort of love. During these days, I would wake up and my head would hurt and I would realize that in my dream, I had said to myself, I should write some poetry. But my dreams never explained to me why or how. How to sing in these dark times. It is true that I had been with poetry for a long time since I was a teenager. Those loves of many years and our bodies changing together, yet also the deepening of this love despite that day with the breeze in the bar, we talked about what we called the going for it, who had gone for it, who hadn't gone for it. And then we talked about who had been going for it and then no longer was going for it, but hadn't dropped out either. And each name we mentioned, mainly if they were thought a woman, but not always, we located the minute where they stopped going for it and a moment when they had been stalked or harassed. They walked about as usual or they lived their lives as usual and they just stopped going for it. And no one noticed it as related to anything. Earlier in this day of cool breezes and beer, another friend had dropped by on his way to the doctor to get an all day ketamine push. Years ago, he had been bitten by a tick, a tick that may or may not have been weaponized, but whether the virus he had in his blood was created by a state or just by the things we are doing to the environment in this moment, maybe those things are the same. He was now in pain all the time. The ketamine was to reset his pain receptors. He already had to detox from opiates in the past and they didn't want to have to do it again. A nurse was going to push the dose incrementally and take him into a hole for an hour. Before he left, I asked him when he was in the hole to figure out why there was poetry. He texted me a few years, a few, he texted me hours later. It said orange and yellow, the breeze off the bay. He meant that same breeze I had been enjoying with beers. He added, the clouds, Mount Diablo in the distance, the warm sun. And then a few days later, he texted, there needs to be some pleasure in the world. A few minutes later, poetry is what is left of life, more singing. I texted back Brecht in the dark times where they'll also be singing. And yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. That night I thought if I just read all of Brecht, I would maybe find the singing. So I began to read Breck that night in bed with my son while he too read before he went to sleep. 
There was a new addition. It was hard to hold because it was so big. I rested it on a pillow and I rested my head on a pillow and I turned the pages looking for the singing. I couldn't find the singing. What I found instead was a series of questions. I was reluctant, imageless, I lost, lost a little too, not in the middle of the woods, but in the middle of all that defines this world, this moment, a busy street corner might be the only way to think of it. Poetry should be a place for the questions, not the answers, some say. But when I read it, I felt as if I thought, as if it thought it could hold answers and maybe it needed to do so in this a minute for some, but I needed otherwise. When I said I am lost, they said, come down to the plaza. And I said, okay, and I suited up by which, which I mean, I put on my jeans and my running shoes and my mini layers of flannel and stuck a water bottle in my bag. I met them there in the afternoon light. We milled around listening to others declaim, nodded our heads at those we recognized. Dark came early and suddenly the moms were getting tear gassed elsewhere, some sort of feds. We didn't even know who they were, we're just appearing people. The next day we learned the term persistent presence. There are avatars on Twitter who would sometimes lecture tweet. Those of you who don't, know, don't notice how fascism arrives, I assure you it isn't on cat's feet. As if we had not read our history, as if we had not felt the sharpness of a cat's claws. It wasn't that we didn't notice, we did and it didn't help. Some of us gathered our children close and decided to wait it out, others showed up. Still others just felt the consciousness of earth some of these others momentarily, just left the consciousness of Earth, some of these others momentarily, too many of them permanently. I asked one who came back from death what it was like over there, and he said, nothing, it is nothing. I picked up breath again, breath again. I wanted to learn how to write all the peace and the war, the order and the chaos, the joy and the despair at the same time. What is a poem, I told myself, if not that magical thing that inventories everything so that the harms and hurts of all our lives are understood in some way. Rep did not answer, turned to Rekaiser, also did not answer. I thought briefly of that shield made for Achilles, the one where the moon and the sun shine at the same time, the one with the two cities, with the sowing and the reaping, the one that ends with the ocean. And then went back to Twitter and watched the video of the federal militia arrest an old man who brought a leaf blower to a protest so as to blow back the endless tear gas. Thanks. Thank you so much, Juliana. That was really incredible. Um, that's. It's really amazing. I'm really happy that you're able to share that piece. Um, I'd only read the excerpts um, that you mentioned, and um, I'm really grateful that you're able to share um, everything else. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a QA and a um, open to everyone. Uh, if you'd like to ask anyone a question, Juliana Yanyi, um, please just message your question to Andrea. Andrea has the helpful Q&A parenthetical next to their name. So if you're searching, you should find them. Um, for now, and I'll, I'll um, ask both Yunyi and Juliana, I'll, I'll just keep you uh, unmuted. Uh, so feel That's free occupied. to jump in. <laughs> so feel free to jump in, however. Um, first of all, thank you both so much. Uh, this was really a, an incredible night and um, I find it, you know, uh, clarifying, terrifying, and galvanizing all at once, um, which I, I think is, I guess, the only way we can move forward. I wanted to ask uh, both of you, um, specifically with regards to um, Poetry Magazine's refusal to platform uh, concerns regarding Toby Martinez de la Rivas's publication, um, and in the contents of Du Bois's telegram where you kind of map out, uh, Juliana, uh, the influence of things like the Ford Foundation and historically how cultural institutions, um, often ones that receive a lot of funding, are de facto kind of acting out or engaging in either FBI, you know, um, uh, CIA foreign policy or uh, other kinds of institutionalist, uh, nationalist propagandizing. What, in this case, it was a confusing mixture because I 
wasn't sure what it was that poets and poetry community could do to counteract the influence of what happened. Um, and uh, the count, I was gonna ask you, how do you believe that poets in the poetry community can counteract the influence of what could be considered nationalist canon making apparatuses? And what are some of the consequences of nothing is done if you believe that the answer lies entirely without or outside of or even a conceptual framework of poetry community? I don't know. I mean, did you, you know, did you see in that essay to poetry magazine? Have you tried, you tried that? Uh, which, which one? The one you just read. Um, sorry, there's actually, there's a weird sound in the background <laughs> that I was deeply distracted by because <laughs> um, I was afraid that it was distracting all of you. Um, it's coming from our basement, which is scary. Um, can you just repeat the question? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's, I'm, just, I'm like, is there a raccoon in the basement right now? I don't know. I apologize. I'm still kind of recovering from tonight um, in a good way. So I was <laughs> rambling all over the place, but I was thinking of how, what could be said about what kind of responses poets and um, specifically framing a poetry community um, what could be done to kind of counteract these kinds of funded institutions that are able to uh, make decisions uh, be due to their funding um, and kind of stonewall everyone? Um, what could be done to counteract their kind of influence and counteract their ability to just churn out, you know, canonical works um, without any like, uh, uh, I guess, direct direct attack on institution. I guess where, mm -hmm. where do people what gather? Do do? Where do people gather? Yeah. Yeah, like what? I mean, um, I think it's like, well, I I don't know. I, I, I genuinely don't have like the answer. I feel like this is an ongoing question for all of us um, who are in, invested in different forms of not, not necessarily canon making, but different forms of reading and being with poetry in the world. Like, um, I do think though that there's something something to be said about being able to be extra institutional, um, which is something I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do. Like, how do I survive financially as a writer while also, um, I don't know, still participating and creating some sort of place where dialogue can happen. Um, so I have a Substack now, which I feel like everyone has a Substack now, but um, that's one place where I feel like I've been able to have more conversations with people that are kind of outside of the purview of what one might traditionally think of as like, now, like I'm waiting to be published by poetry or some other place. Like now I just publish what I think on my own. And I know, I, I think like, that is in itself like a radical thing to do because why are you like something that I kind of ask myself is like, why, why am I waiting for someone else to allow me to speak? Um, and I feel like that's kind of the first individual hurdle you have to get over of like, well, what's stopping you from speaking and how can you get out what you want to say or need to say? Um, and I think the other thing is that when stuff like what happened with Martinez happens, um, to, to be vocal about it and to talk about it and to not just to, I mean, like do what you have the capacity to do, obviously. Um, and, but I, but like, I, even though this is not the most comfortable work for me to do, like, I would like to just work on my second book manuscript, please. Like I'm writing sad love poems, like would love to stay there, but I, I think that there's something to be said about a sense of kind of, of literary citizenship that is involved in kind of using whatever, uh, whatever you have, what kind of fac whatever faculties you have to contribute to working against um, interpretations that require your silence. Um, so that's kind of what I'm, I'm working on with this essay of like, what, what, what's, what is the next, what, what is the way that we can respond to this? Um, and also to, you know, uh, to educate myself on like, what is the history that I'm kind of talking to and about? Um, because I do think that 
the way that we use words and what words mean matter, um, which I think sometimes that can be lost in uh, moments like the, this politically when we are scared for our lives. So it's, yeah, I think that like, and, the, and in a way the people who could be helping us in terms of like speaking to what's historically available are uh, like talking, talking to us as though we're just dogmatic young people who love K-pop too much. Right. Thank you, Yanyi. Um, we actually have a, a, our first question from someone in the audience uh, from Corey Barricado. Um, I believe he's, this is an open question, so whoever wants to answer, but he's asking, what poets do you teach your students and why? And what is the poetry teacher's role in combating things like fascism and nationalism? Oh, love this question. Also a sneaky way to get into our syllabi. <laughs> <laughs> I just answered, so I think Juliana, you can go. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I mean, on that second, the second part of that question, which is, um, I mean, I think all you can do is just kind of explain them the, so how the system works or something like that, or what it actually does, or like, you know, here are the, here are the choices that are available to you as a writer in some sense. Um, and um, here's the complications around them and here's the difficulties around trying to find your way out or, you know, that kind of stuff is I think about, about it. And then, I mean, in terms of like, I mean, I feel like I, like the, who I'm teaching is constantly changing, which is kind of as it should be. Um, and it kind of goes through phases um, depending on like where I find myself in my, you know, try, you know, what, what I'm trying to understand myself in that moment. Um, and so that list of poets that I had in there, which was like Shelley, um, Césaire, um, you know, like that kind of list for Deva, like those are the kind of people that I've been kind of currently teaching. I mean, and it used to be like Teresa Hawkeye Chal and Gertrude Stein, you know, prior to that. And there was Broth, I went through a Brothwaite period. Um, and, um, you know, also trying to bring in, you know, newer work also at the, at the, at the same time, I mean, the thing about it is like, there's just like so much work that it's a series of arbitrary decisions. Like luckily there's so much good work. Um, and so if, even if you limit yourself to good work, there's a lot of it out there, which is nice. And do you um, have a, a specific response to how or what a poetry teacher's role is in combating fascism or nationalism? It's like a small that's a very. That's a very <laughs> <laughs> intense question, but. Yeah, I, would, I, I wouldn't that. even know how to, <laughs> you know, kind of like how to do, what, you know, what to say about it. I mean, there are those moments where like these kind of like where the classroom gets very politicized um, that happen in moments of like more intense fascist uprisings than the one that we're having right now, which still feels to me like it's an open question about, whether that movement can actually take off or not in some sense. But, you know, like, I mean, there's a lot, there, there's a lot of challenges around that, around, around fascism in Brazil, challenges to fascism from the university that were kind of interesting. Um, speaking to that uh, somewhat, uh, something that's been bothering or haunting me for a while um, was a quote by Federico Garcia Lorca who um, reportedly said um, to another poet, as for me, I'll never be political. I'm a revolutionary because all true poets are revolutionaries, don't you agree? But political, never. This was a, a few short months before he was executed actually by mm. uh, the uh, fascist death squad. And it's, I know it's, it's pretty much an unfair question to, to preface this, I'm about to ask both of you. <laughs> and I, you know, you directly reference this kind of, not even necessarily vacillation, but the complexity of a question of how can we talk about poetry in terms of its engagement um, and, you know, uh, with politics. And I, I found myself, especially in my early political education, uh, it kind of echoed that sentiment that Lorca said that there's some sort of, you know, revolutionary sentiment by writing poetry that's in the ether, but the actualized 
political machinery of it is kind of uh, almost beside the point. Um, and obviously in the context of our situation now, um, where I, you know, I do feel, you know, anxiety as, as a marginalized person, I just feel anxiety uh, with the rise of um, right-wing violence. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder about that um, because we see things, or at least, please correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like there are specific efforts by fascists to kind of claim poetry and all cultural production as like a node for uh, over, you know, uh, overarching culture war. And in um, Du Bois's telegram, you make the point, Juliana, of how, you know, uh, institutions like the CIA and the FBI appear to take literature very seriously in terms of the anxiety of how it can affect things. Uh, Frank Wilderson, who is, uh, who was at the project virtually uh, a few weeks ago, actually made the point that the FBI has uh, the largest collection of black literature in the world, mm -hmm. specifically because they're so anxious about monitoring it um, and, and trying to, I guess, if I can put words in their mouth, decode it, I suppose, to kind of use it as for more effective policing. Uh, so there is this divide, it seems to me, to, between you know the sense that poetry is absolutely not enough, um, and also a sense that it could be a means towards engagement, and also this real anxiety I felt um, by uh, uh, expressed by fascists um, that poetry is actually very dangerous, um, and expressed by institutions like the FBI and the CIA that literature is a dangerous thing that has to be quelled and controlled and you know diverted. So I, this is a very unfair question, but how would you speak to that kind of divide? And do you come down on one side or the other, or do you do you feel that there's kind of a mixture? Do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. I mean, I was also still thinking about kind of the question of like teaching and stuff, um, because I I guess the like. Do I summarize correctly when I say like, is the question really like, is, is, um, is poetry political? Like, is, like, is that the question? I'm trying, like, there's a lot, there are a lot of examples that you included there, obviously. Um, but yeah. I just, I'm, I'm like trying to figure out what I should answer particularly. Um, yeah. Yes. I don't want to, yes. I mean, I, I guess I, I think about it in kind of in terms of, like I think about it in terms of like, what, what's the difference between like poetry and rhetoric? Like what, when, cause po I think poetry can be anything. Um, I think that there are kinds of poetry that are rhetorical. I think like a, a very easy example um, would be like Pablo Neruda's work, like towards later in his life when he was writing kind of very directly about the plight of um, the revolutionaries that he was speaking on. Um, but I mean, is, is I feel like, I, I, at least to me, like the way that I look at poetry and the way that I think about poetry is it's, it's a way that I talk to myself. And as I live my life, it's, it's the thoughts that I have freely with myself. And if I'm able to say what I want to say to myself, perhaps or become conscious of, of something um, for myself, then perhaps I would be moved to action that would also be in the name of my own liberation or in the name of my own freedom. So um, of course the CIA has like this huge trove of black literature um, because they understand that the US state is a white supremacist state and has always been that and know that like there's a level of like the ways that something has been built usually probably gets dismantled through some kind of violence, especially if it was built violently. Um, I, I also think that um, like, I wanna answer the other question too about like what's the role of a poetry teacher right now uh, or like a literature, I guess a, a writing teacher at the moment. Um, uh, so I, I kind of re like, I've been teaching this semester and I realized that I was doing it wrong. Um, I was like, you know, assigning the readings that I wanted to assign, et cetera. 
like all of this stuff that I wish I had been given by a professor. And I just canceled like all of the readings for the rest of the semester because I realized that like, I had a, a mentor of mine tell me in the beginning of the semester that the only thing that a professor is supposed to do, uh, a literature professor is to, supposed to do is to love the students and give them, and, and love being undivided attention. And uh, to, I think, be able to pay attention to yourself in this moment is very radical to me um, because that's kind of where action emerges from. So my, my only job is to help my students speak for themselves and then to speak to each other and for there to be a space where that's possible. Um, and I, I think that literature is a place where that is possible for me um, personally, like when I'm, I can read whenever I feel like it, thankfully, right now. Um, and it's not necessarily, it, it's, it's something that can happen across time, like with dead people, with people who are alive. Um, that, and I think that's, I, that's something that um, is hard to come by. Yeah, I mean, I think poetry in itself, I would say no, that it's a, it's a genre that has a wide range of political uses that it gets put to it. And, you know, like we saw Marinetti just came up and, you know, we could do Yates and you mentioned Elliot, you know, like there's a whole kind of like right wing moment. Um, that's even more, those are even more liberal right-wing examples. There's even more, more terrible ones. Um, and so I, in, in general though, like right now in this moment, I feel like poetry is pretty much a kind of like a liberal project, um, which has a lot to do with these institutions that you were asking about earlier, because they're pretty much liberal institutions and they've kind of like, um, kind of seen, you know, like, you know, like most of our literature has, is kind of, um, has, just has like liberal, somewhat liberal values in some way would be one way to put it. And um, so I don't, I, I kind of think like it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily work like that. In that moment when like um, the FBI is collecting all those files, I mean, I, I, I kind of see them doing that less because of their anxiety that there are some, I'm sure, some people within those, in, those moments, politicians, people that work for the FBI that do think that literature, um, um, lead us all into out into the streets and to rioting, um, or at least there are people that say that. I've never been convinced that that's true, um, but I think that the main thing that they want to do is they really want to sever the, the the kind of activist writer in some sense. Like they want to they want the writer to be in these liberal institutions writing this liberal work, and that's kind of what their interest in the in the literature is all the time. And I think that's part of why they don't in those moments, like in the you know the most recent moment that we had this was around like a, in the 68 era, why the FBI would always go and knock on the writer's door and be like, can I answer a few questions? And they weren't doing things like putting them in jail. They were just kind of being like, um, why don't you move over here? Why don't I threaten you with the fact that I know that you exist as, as, as someone and then, um, and put a kind of like a, what's that called? Like a dampening effect or whatever it is, a cooling on this kind of alliance that you may have that may come yet, that may not be there yet, or that may come yet between these more kind of militant factions that were existing in like the, the 68 era. And so I think that's kind of been a, a kind of a lot of, a lot of their interest. And then, but at the same time, there, there is a, a kind of, very, there is often a militant literature. It's often quite beautiful. McKay's If We Must Die is my kind of um, favorite example, the poem that I find the most moving around that. And um, there's literature that comes out of social movements, um, in different, all sorts of different ways. Some of it is actually also quite important. And um, so I just, I, there's something about it where I would just say like there's many, it does many things. It's a, it's a genre. Um, so it, it gets put to all these different uses. Um, if I could perhaps ask an even more impossible question, what would you say drew you to, to use, to, use poetry or do you, when you're working with poetry, are you using it towards a particular purpose? I mean, this obviously could have changed throughout. I know it has for me throughout my life. So it, there could be multiple answers that were correct at the time. For both of us? For both. And the answer could be that it's, you don't use it for anything, but I was just interested based on what you said. And I'm also interested in the negative space 
of these questions as well. I use poetry to think. Um, it's the way that I think. Uh, it's, uh, I think, the most freeing of the genres that I was presented with as a young person. Um, I never have liked rules and uh, I think it was, it was a place for me to think in whatever way that I wanted to with language. Um, and that was very important to me as like, especially when I was working at the same time mm -hmm. um, while I was trying to write, being able to just to write prose poems or write, write things that were very, very short and, and know that they were also poems was very important to me. But now I'm able to do much more sustained work and thinking. So I, now I also, so I write in essays too now, you know? So it, it, it's in a way it follows what my life has the capacity for. Great. Yeah, I'm like, I would just want to maybe even get the same, the same answer um, in some way. I mean, a good poem is always really, I still find them really lovely when I find them, um, you know, in moving and um, primarily around that idea that they, they help me think things through that I haven't been able to think through otherwise. Um, and they have a potential to do that kind of differently than like these other technologies like the novel, um, which seem to require certain, have, have a certain series of like things that seem to need to happen within them. Um, so like the kind of openness of, um, of the genre, the way that it, it's kind of a term that we use for very, Many, many different kinds of writing from, you know, mind writing and metrical to not to screaming to um, quiet lyric denunciation, you know, and all, all that kind of comes into that form and, and that same moment. Um, I mean, I, other than that, I don't really know. I mean, I kind of have some narrative about like, you know, like showing up as an undergraduate and getting into a poetry workshop and kind of never getting out. Um, like the entanglement coming just from that kind of having ended up my first semester of my freshman year um, but I, and then like, I don't know. I mean, I'm always like, oh, I'm out. And then I'm back in it again. Um, right. That's incredible. Just to think of that, that orbit, I, I feel like a lot of us probably understand that ball. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> okay. Um, okay. It looks like we're getting uh, another question. Um, I think we do have time for one more. Um, Can I say how I please. how cute I think Roberto and Justin is behind you? Oh my god! <laughs> That's very cute. No. I love to embarrass you. <laughs> <laughs> You're very good at it. <laughs> You have the perfect precision. <laughs> um, I, I am, I, I see a question here. Um, I, I, I'm gonna ask it. I hope the individual doesn't mind. Um, but a, a question is, is Yin Yi said a marginalized person must learn to read the ambiguous much of poetry traffic traffics in ambiguity. Do you think a marginalized person is better at reading poetry than someone in the spotlight? Huh. Like someone from the, in the center or what, I guess I wonder what the spotlight means, but. Um, I, yeah, I suppose it means uh, mm -hmm. someone who's centered normally. Right. Um, I don't think necessarily, I think that um, situationally, everyone has kind of has different experiences and different ways of seeing and knowing um, and reading, which uh, I think ben benefits us all being able to see something from as many sides as possible. Uh, yeah, that's at basically what my answer is. It's very like liberal voicey, but which is not kind of what I'm going for, but it's, I think <laughs> what I really believe of like, um, like I, I do think that like in terms of close reading for actual like crypto fascist stuff, like writers in particular are much better at like seeing what's possibly going on. Like those close reading skills are very useful while you're trying to figure out where like the next 
fascist gathering is going to happen when it's being like distributed in codes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Can I ask a question before we go? I, want, I have many questions I wanted to ask you. <laughs> but um, I was kind of interested in that moment when you're like, the, and then the poem appeared in the Paris Review or a, ver, a version of, a, and no one said anything. That was one, I'm kind of interested in like what you make of that. And then the, the second one that I'm kind of, which is kind of, I think related to that, which is that question of like, did you submit this to Poetry Magazine? Which is like, why do you think there wasn't a willingness to have a discussion around it? Cause I mean, there must've been people that would have been willing because poets are always willing to kind of get in there and fight, right? Or, you know, have little, mm -hmm. there, there's always like a moment where 10 poets will write statements about a work. That's a long tradition of that even. That's one of the ways that the poetry right. community talks about work often is through getting many different people to kind of present it. And that didn't seem to ever be a possibility or an option, even though there's like a huge blog and there's like a print magazine and like, why, what do you think's going on there? Okay, well, so the Paris Review question, so it came out in the Paris Review. I think that um, like, I think that like, there's a whole kind of separate poetry drama story. Like this is my favorite thing. I love talking about the gossip, um, which is why I'm writing about this, but um, <laughs> poetry that, so in 2018, poetry was already kind of like, in that in in a bad state, um, I guess in arrears with the community, because um, they had already. I actually wrote on this at the time, but they had actually um, had a call for submissions for a trans uh, focused issue mm -hmm. that they later very quietly and silently canceled because of um, something that basically happened with the editor um, who. Like, tweeted, et cetera, et cetera. So there was already kind of like ill will toward poetry. And I think that this poem coming out November after that summer, there was like even more kind of like attention towards like what they were doing. So th I think that's the main reason why the Paris Review kind of didn't, didn't have that attention um, versus poetry. Um, I also don't know if I'm, like I get, I ha I subscribe to the Paris Review. So like, I, I remember opening it and reading it, but I don't know if Poetry had actually posted the Martinez poem like online as like one of their regular social media things. And I don't know if the Paris Review does stuff like that. Um, so I think that's another reason why it, no one may have noticed it or seen it. Um, it also came out a little later in the year when a lot of poets work in institutions are, are, are students themselves. Um, so th I think that was, another thing of like, it was finals or whatever. <laughs> um, just like situationally that that was the case. Um, I really, I actually, I have no idea why there was no like letters to the editor or like why n more people were not invited to talk about what happened um, in the actual, in Poetry Magazine itself. Um, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I do kind of know that like, uh, from just like what happened this summer. So I'm like, sorry for anyone who doesn't know all of the <laughs> drama, but like this summer um, I did, like I was doing some research along with a bunch of other people on like um, Henry Bynan, Bynan um, who like mm -hmm. was on the board, who was ex-CIA and who was also like the ex-president of Northwestern when all these Asian American students were trying to start an Asian American studies program and they have like a 23 day hunger strike. And he's just quoted in this like article that I read about it saying like, basically this is not a way to bargain. He wouldn't acknowledge them. So I, I just have a feeling that like part of the policy was being driven by maybe him, maybe other people on the board. Um, and I'm, I have no idea kind of where John Sher like was in, in terms of that, but I was surprised yet not surprised to learn this summer that the like poetry magazine has has had this tradition of the editor in chief being the only one who selects the pieces for the magazine. I don't know if that also counts for like letters to the editor and that kind of stuff. But when I was subscribed to it, I, I don't really remember seeing any letters to the editor. Maybe that's changed. Mm -hmm. That would have been great though. Like when the Yi Fen Chow thing happened, Asian American Writers Workshop created a forum where Asian American writers responded. Um, yeah. in 2015. So yeah, it's definitely a thing that could have been done. I don't, I, I just don't, I think that this, this particular case was like, um, it was kind of funny because it, it had all these other factors going on of like British poet, 
Um, so there's a, an, a whole other context in which the poem like exists that you would have to learn the crypto fascism stuff. You would have to learn way more about like what's going on there. Um, and then Martinez's work in itself is, is pretty much like Christian mysticism times like a thousand. So it, it can be hard to read in itself and to figure out like how much of this is the symbolism and, and how much of this is like what he thinks or like what he's trying to say. Like it, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, a, it kind of felt like a conceptual project when I was reading through it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we actually have one more question from someone in the audience if you're both up for it. Um, my water and my flowers. <laughs> I'll show you my flowers. My partner got them for me. Aww. Aww. <laughs> uh, so this question is from uh, Maria Shia. Excuse me if I'm mispronouncing your name, Maria, um, but I uh, invite you to speak. We'll be unmuting you now. All right, thanks. Uh, so yeah, a question for Juliana and Yanyi. Um, do you ever experience like any like dissonance or difficulty when you are writing, when you think about poetry's relationship to like the institutions of capitalism and its role in cultural production? And like, does it ever get in the way of you finding focus or just like finding your you know joy in, in still doing it? Can I ask a follow-up question? So when you say dissonance, are you thinking in particular of like, is thinking about, oh, like, I want to submit this to a magazine, like that kind of dissonance of like, uh, should I write what they want me to write versus something else? Is that like, or are you kind of speaking to something else? I think so. I think there's, I think there's that, but also mm -hmm. maybe just wondering whether like what you write is really like just all the ways in which you're filtering it through your mind and mm -hmm. just getting a little bit discouraged about how, you know, you yourself are also, you know, a product of that, you know, mm -hmm. you have your own relationships to those institutions and your own like anxiety, maybe financial anxieties and, and you're, you know, you're participating in capitalism. So. I'd say all the fucking time. <laughs> um, but um, I don't know. I mean, I spent, I was been working on this project where I've been kind of like looking at like like what the what the prestigious literature is like the literature that wins these major prizes and I've mm. been assembling for years this large database on it and it's just really depressing I've spent a lot of time in therapy on it and um but at the same time like you read something that's really good and it's that helps I mean that's the moment where you have to hold tight to like the stuff that matters um it's not all it's not all terrible just some of it is <laughs> What's the most depressing thing that you've learned so far? Just how many writers like have like, you know, multiple Ivy League degrees, like mm. very few, uh, you know, that didn't go through that system in some way. Right. Um, and I think I thought that literature was this great egalitarian project and I've had to rethink that, that it's actually, and I, I don't think that means that the literature that these people are writing are bad. I just think it means that like, it, it's got this much narrow demographic of people that write and also that read that I had thought because I kind of was naive around it and it's been depressing. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> that note, I um, want to thank you both um, for your readings tonight. Um, it was really an incredible night. I want to thank everyone who joined us um, and for the great questions from the audience. Um, I, again, I am really appreciative um, for everything that happened. And I, I do feel, like I said, a, a bit more clarified and galvanized. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank uh, you, Roberto. And thank thanks you. to all the folks at the Poetry Project. Yes, of course. Thank you to um, Matt and Laura and Andrea um, and Anna who have been helping with tonight's event. Um, thank you all. Um, our next event is on Thursday, excuse me, it's actually tomorrow. Um, and uh, we're going to have um, Ugly Duckling Press pamphlet uh, writers um, discussing their work. Um, so join us tomorrow at 8 p.m. Um, you can go to event, a poetryproject.org slash events uh, to find our upcoming events. And we hope to see you then.
Thank you, everyone.